Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, it is Friday night, and that means it's time for another Blender stream at 7 o'clock. So, tonight is the night where you're going to talk about rigging and Blender. This is going to be a bare-bones introduction for people that have absolutely no idea how to rig at all. And so, if you are one of those people, then I'm excited that you're here so we can start talking about how to rig stuff up. So, if you don't really know what rigging is, rigging is basically the process of taking... Uh, something like a skeletal structure and allowing it to morph and modify a model that you have so you can animate it. Uh, so think about a skeletal structure and a human body as being uh, something that we're going to be talking about tonight. So that's a good example. But you can also have other kinds of rigs. You can have mechanical rigs. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about uh, three examples tonight of different ways to tie it, sort of rig things up in Blender. Uh, and so we're not going to be getting into doing any full characters that would take uh, quite a bit of time to go over and it would probably uh, take an entire course, but I will be getting into uh, examples that you can apply directly to your characters if you're working on character animation. So uh, let's get into some basics tonight. Uh, one thing before we get started, there is a blend file that I've uh, made available for you guys to download in the description. So if you want to follow along and you're on your desktop computer or whatever, um, feel free to download that. Uh, it should be available to anybody. Uh, so if it's not, let me know in the chat and I will fix it in the live stream. Uh, but go ahead and download that file in the description. It should be towards the top. And it's a little bit of um, an example file that I'm going to be using tonight in the uh, sort of project. So let's jump over to Blender and get started. Uh, here we go. Okay. So this is the blend file that you guys should have access to in the description. Uh, I've created a, a really basic uh, character mannequin, and this is just the lower half that you can see here. Um, and if you guys are interested, I may finish out the whole thing and then provide that for you guys as well uh, with the same link. But uh, for tonight, it would take too long to do the whole thing. And these are all just individual pieces. They're not connected right now, uh, but you can see in the outliner, they're all named appropriately. Uh, so everything on the left side of the character's body has an, um, a suffix with a dot L, and everything on the right side of the character's body has a suffix of a dot R. And uh, then anything that's neutral center, uh, such as the hips, will have no suffix. Uh, this can be important depending on what method you're using for rigging, uh, for rigging in Blender. Uh, so for some of the more advanced methods, you would want to start paying attention to how you're labeling things because it can be important. Uh, but to get started, let's just go with some very basic um, methods that you can use to start trying to get a rig together in Blender. And as I said before, rigging doesn't have to be um, done any one particular way. If you want to animate something, as long as you can kind of figure out a workflow that'll let you move things around and keyframe things, uh, and it works for your scene, then that is fine. Uh, so let's start off with uh, something that you may have seen before uh, called parenting. So the idea of parenting, if I create uh, two objects here, and I'm gonna create a cube and a sphere, and I'm gonna put these next to each other, and let's just solo these for now. Uh, so parenting is basically uh, setting up some sort of hierarchical relationship between multiple objects in your scene. And so with parenting, you can select the first object and then select the object that you want to be the parent in this case. And what you would do is you would hit Control P on your keyboard and you would it's going to bring up the parenting menu and you're going to say set parent to uh, one of these options. And so you've got object parenting. Uh, we talked about this before in the beginners. Um, live streams uh, for keeping object transforms the same. So if you've already moved objects around the scene, uh, this will make sure that they stay in the same place as they currently occupy uh, and don't snap around. Um, you've got vertex parenting, which we haven't talked about before. Uh, and so we may talk about that tonight, but uh, for right now, let's just choose object parenting. And so now we have a child and we have a parent. And so the child, if you start moving it around, you'll notice that this little relationship line, uh, this black dotted line is drawn between the origins of the two objects. And so the parent now controls the child. And you can do this uh, with several nestings, uh, one inside of the other. And so if we were to create another sphere by duplicating this one, 
you're going to see that it's going to indicate that the parent is still the cube at this point. So the, the cube is still going to move both of these around. But if we want to instead make the sphere uh, a little smaller, let's picture these as joints on a skeleton then this joint, we want to be connected to, to this uh, parent joint. So if this was an ankle and this was a knee, then we would select this one and then shift and right click and select this one. Let's hit control P. And then again, we just choose object. And so now we're starting to build a more complex layering of the parenting setup that you have here. So again, the cube controls all of these at this point. Then this sphere just controls its child, which is this little sphere down here. And then this sphere is the biggest child is that the right way to say that? Smallest child? I don't know. It's it's the lowest child in the hierarchy, so it uh, won't be able to control anything else because nothing else is connected to it. Uh, but this is how you start setting up more complex relationships. And so this will control rotation, scaling, uh, and movement. Uh, and so it doesn't always take a, a fancy rig to get things going in the right direction. If you want to start uh, getting basic animation into mechanical objects, parenting is a great way to do that. And there's a lot of uh, interesting things that you can do with parenting relationships uh, that make this a very powerful method uh, for working on your rigs. Uh, so let's talk about how vertex parenting works, because this is kind of interesting. So we've only really explored parenting to objects in previous videos, and uh, vertex parenting is kind of a unique thing. So interestingly enough, if we were to duplicate this again, uh, again, you're gonna see the relationship lines indicate what the parent situation looks like. You can imagine this is sort of like a graph, and uh, obviously this is controlling the two smaller spheres, and then these are all children of the bigger sphere and then the cube still controls these. So uh, it's important to understand how this works so that you guys can kind of um, connect these things up. And if you look in the outliner under the cube, all of these objects are now embedded within this cube object. So if we were to hit the plus sign next to the cube, you're gonna see the first sphere right here. When we open that up, you're gonna see this smaller sphere and then the sphere inside of that. And so each time you parent, you're just gonna get a sub nesting uh, lower and lower and lower into this. Uh, so Lorian is in the chat and she's asking how deep can you nest parents? And uh, the honest truth is I'm not sure, but I've never hit a limit. So uh, if you wanna just keep uh, you know, doing this, uh, there, there shouldn't really be a problem uh, continuing to do this for any sort of complex rigging situation that you would uh, encounter. Now, um, you know, you could prove me wrong. So if you run into a situation where that is the case, definitely let me know. And uh, we can talk about why that is the case and try to figure that problem out. Uh, but let's talk about vertex parenting. So the difference between vertex parenting and object parenting is that you are going to parent straight into a mesh uh, surface. And so if we were going to get rid of, let's say these three objects here, and now we just have the uh, sphere still parented to the cube. What I want to do is go ahead and kill the relationship between the parents. So I'm going to select the child object. And instead of control P, I'm just going to hit alt P on the keyboard. And this is going to clear the parent for me. So again, we have clear parent, we have clear parent and keep the transformation, which again is going to make sure that it doesn't move from its current location. And then we have clear parent inverse, which is going to go the opposite direction. So uh, let's just clear the parent. And now we're back to just two individual objects. And again, in the outline, you can see that these are just now siblings. They're next to each other. So vertex parenting. What I need to do in this case is jump into a mesh. And I'm going to jump into vertex mode. And you can pick any vertex you want. But first, we pick the object that needs to be the child. And then we shift click the object that is going to be the vertex parent. And then what we do before we parent is we jump into edit mode with tab. And this is only going to go into edit mode on the active object. And so now we can pick a vertex. And if we hit control P, we're going to see this little menu pop up that says make vertex parent. So now if we do that, you're going to see instead of going to the origin, this uh, child goes to this vertex uh, instead. And so now uh, it is a child of this single vertex. And so if this vertex morphs or moves around, and you can see at this point all the possibilities that might come out of this, 
uh, for how powerful this could be, it will then move this child object around. And so if you were going to use uh, shape keys like we've talked about before, uh, or any sort of vertex grouping with a modifier that changes the overall uh, formation of the geometry and the topology of your mesh, then as that morphs, it will control any of the child uh, vertex parents or sibling or vertex children. <laughs> so uh, there's another option in here for how you would do a vertex parent. So let's clear this again with Alt P and I'm going to keep the transform so it's in the same place. Uh, so let's right click on the sphere and then let's shift right click on the cube. And this time I'm going to select three vertices. And so what we know about uh, vertices and meshes is that one vertex in space is basically just a coordinate. It's an X, a Y, and a Z coordinate combined to give us a location in space. With two of these vertices, you've got an edge that's formed. But the second you have at least three vertices, you've got a plane. And so typically we work in quads, so we talk about four vertices and faces being this, but you can also just have uh, triangles. And so in this case, if we had a, uh, a need to do a vertex parent, what we could do is select three of these, hit Control P, and we can do a vertex parent. And now what we're essentially gonna get is a special vertex parent that goes straight to the face. So uh, now, if we jump into face mode, and I move this around, we're gonna get the same sort of uh, condition, but now we actually have the ability to rotate and control that as well. So before with just the vertex, all you're gonna be able to control is the X, Y, and Z position of the vertice. But now that we have a face which has a rotation and you know it has a scale and all of that, we can control uh, all of that from here. So it looks like scale isn't affected, but the rotation definitely is, which with a single vertex you wouldn't be able to do. So that's gonna be something that we can use as we get into this tonight, but I just wanted to give you a basic primer on how parenting works in case you had never done that before. So let's delete these objects and go back into uh, out of local view and into our scene here. Uh, so you don't always have to create a rig. Let's just start this off with some parenting and see how this works. So obviously the leg, you know, the old song, you know, the hip bones connected to the, um, the pelvis, you know, and, and the knees connected to the shin and, and all of that. So we're going to select the leg first and then shift right click and select the hips. Control P and we're going to pick object. So now the hip is going to control this leg. We're going to do the same thing with the other leg over here and do that. Then we're going to have the knee, which we're going to skip for right now. And we're going to move on to the shin and we're going to connect that up to the leg. So control P and select objects, same thing on this side. And if you want, instead of just using control P, you can use object and keep transform to make sure these don't move around. Uh, but hopefully they'll stay in place. And we're just gonna connect these up and uh, one up on top of each other. And so now what we have is we have a basic rig minus the kneecaps. So anytime the root part of our uh, mesh here for the hips on the mannequin is rotated or moved around. The rest of the lower part of the body is going to go with it. Same thing with the lower extremities like we just saw with the cube and the sphere. Now that these are rotating, the bottom parts are going to go with those just like this right down to the bottom. Now what you're going to start noticing first is that they're not rotating from the right places. Uh, we don't have any sort of um, advanced controlling about um, you know, how far out these can go and, and the proper way to move them. They're all rotating from the origins of the, uh, the limbs. And so we don't want that. We want the, the rotation to happen up here where the hip is. And so the easiest way to do this if you're using the parenting method is to move the origin around. So we're gonna jump into the front view here. And if we check off the um, jump into edit mode, we can actually select everything and just move this around uh, and do it that way. Or the easiest way to do it is actually just to move your 3D cursor where you want that to uh, snap the origin and get that kind of dialed in somewhere. And then we can imagine that maybe the joint would be floating somewhere in here for the hip and rotate into the side view and the front view to make sure this is lined up. Once we get that 3D cursor positioned in the right place, 
Uh, if you hit Control, Shift, Alt, and C, that's the longest keyboard shortcut I've ever seen in Blender, but uh, that is what the keyboard shortcut is. You can pick how to move the origin around. So we can set the origin to the 3D cursor. Uh, and if you don't want to have to remember the shortcut, we can go to the menu over here that is set origin under the tools palette, and that will let you see the same thing. So we, now we would need to do the same thing for this other side. And what I'm actually going to do is just modify this uh, left side over here. And then we're just going to save ourselves some time and duplicate the copies over to the right side and rename everything. So I'll show you how I did that uh, in case you guys want to build a mannequin of your own. So now what you're going to see is that when we rotate the leg, it's going to rotate around this um, where the joint would essentially be in the body. So we want to then do the same thing for the shin. So let's jump into the side view, place our 3D cursor between these two uh, limbs right here. And then we're going to jump into the front view and move this over so that it is sort of lined up in the middle there. And if you're having it snap onto the surfaces of the kneecap or something like that, you can either hide the kneecap or if you jump into the object panel over here using the in uh, command on the keyboard to open this, you can actually scroll down to the 3D cursor menu and this will let you manually place the 3D cursor in space. So once you have it lined up sort of in the X axis, maybe the depth is off. And in this case, we would just need to move this back in the Y axis. Uh, by dragging this until it's sort of in the center in here. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but we just want to get it in there. So then we select the shin bone, set origin to the 3D cursor. So now we've got the leg, we've got the shin rotating around the kneecap, and we want to do the same thing for the ankle. So we're going to grab the foot uh, mesh down here, jump into the side view, put our 3D cursor there, and then I'm gonna shift this over a tiny bit where it's sort of centered there. Let's set the origin to the 3D cursor again. Okay, so now all three of these should be rotating around the proper position. Okay, so the way that you would duplicate this quickly is let's just go ahead and get rid of all of this geometry. And what I can do is grab all of these pieces. I wanna hit Shift C to reposition my 3D cursor in the center of the um, world here, or I can just zero these out. And then what I wanna do is uh, change my pivot point to the 3D cursor. And all you have to do is hit Shift D to duplicate all of these meshes. I'm gonna hit Escape so that it's duplicated them, but they're on top of each other now. If I start moving that, you'll see that. And now if we scale by a negative one in the X axis, it's gonna basically reverse and flip these to the other side. So if I hit S and then X and then negative one, those are gonna get flipped to the opposite side. And you're gonna notice they're kind of misaligned still, and that's because we have some object rotation on these. And so if you look at the Y axis, we've got a negative six degrees spin on this. And so we need to copy that, but with a positive six degree spin there in order to get these all lined up correctly. And you'll want to make sure that if any of these other rotations are off, that again, you're making sure that you're kind of figuring out which uh, rotation axis needs to be reversed here. In this case, it looks like we're going to be okay by just reversing this top one here. Uh, but we definitely need to kind of look in there and make sure about that. So it's possible this one might need to be flipped. We could play with, yeah, so flipping that's not gonna do anything good for us. Let's undo that. And then, yeah, so that's gonna be fine. So I'm gonna zero this out because this is supposed to sort of be all zero there. And now we've got both sides again. So the only problem we're gonna have at this point is that the legs are gonna be misnamed. Now, if we get into some more of the advanced rigging techniques, there's actually a way to automatically have Blender name these according to your rig. Uh, and so uh, if we are looking under the object uh, menu over here, there you've got some symmetry settings that we can take a look at when we get into rigging that will let you automatically duplicate those names over. Uh, I'm not really sure if there's a way to do it by just using the mesh method and the parenting method, uh, but it's really fast to basically just go in here and rename these to um, this. And actually what you could probably do is search everything that has um, the extension that you are looking for and rename it uh, all in one go there. It might be possible. 
Not sure I've done that before, but I don't remember. But there we go. So now we're kind of back to normal and we've copied all of those uh, proper rotations. Now make sure that you change the pivot point back to the um, individual origins or median point instead of the 3D cursor. Uh, so that way they're rotating around the right uh, parts of the mesh. Okay, so we got a, we got a question. Why can't you grab the origin dot directly to move the origin? Uh, so the, the reason is that there's a special mode for origin uh, moving. So if you look at this uh, down here, it says manipulate center points. Um, and it'll tell you, you can only use this in object pose and weight paint mode only. Uh, and so what would happen is if you grabbed one of these objects and turned this on, um, it's going to let you manipulate these points. So you'll see some weird things happen. Oftentimes people think that there's a bug in Blender if they accidentally turn this on. Uh, and so you'll see that with this checked off, we can't scale or rotate uh, our objects. We can move it around, but we can't uh, scale or rotate. So it can kind of mess you up there. Um, but this is a method you can use to try to reposition your origins as well. Uh, I just like using the 3D cursor because it lets me know visually exactly where it's gonna go and what's gonna happen. And uh, I think it's a pretty quick method as well. Okay, so for the hips, we're not really gonna need uh, to move a lot around. We probably would move it up to somewhere around here if we were gonna connect it to the rest of the body. But in this case, we'll just leave it where it is. And so this is really all you need to start rigging using the parenting method. Uh, so if you wanna start keyframing, uh, you can grab any of these sections and uh, position everything. And then you would just grab every section of the body and then keyframe uh, in uh, one section, move to another uh, frame in your timeline and then reposition everything and keyframe that. And then it would move between point A and point B. Uh, so let's use our vertex parenting to connect the kneecaps and then we'll kind of move on to our next example here. Uh, so for the kneecaps, we have an interesting issue because we've got an object that is uh, on this hard surface model that is supposed to be sort of connecting between these two objects uh, where a joint is bending. And so we can't really, um, you know, connect to both because if we tried to do that, we would have to get into some more advanced deformation rigging, which we're gonna talk about tonight, but we're gonna do it in the third example. Uh, and so for hard surface joints like mannequins, uh, you can think of these like action figures or dolls you don't really want any deformation. Anytime there's supposed to be a bend, you want a joint with a ball in the middle and a bearing, and you wanna be able to just rotate based on the ball bearing. And so we need to pick whether or not this is attached to the thigh or the shin when it is going to bend. And so in this point, we're gonna use our vertex parenting and attach it to possibly like the shin here. So let's uh, right click on the kneecap, shift right click on the shin, and I'm gonna go into local view. Uh, using my forward uh, slash on my numpad. Let's hit tab to jump into edit mode, switch to vertex um, elements there. And then we need to pick a method for parenting. So in this case, uh, we could pick uh, several things to parent this to. In this case, what I'm going to do is just pick three of these to have it always connect to. And I'm gonna do the inside joints here. So I'm gonna pick these two points at the top and then the center one going down the middle like this. So let's hit control P and we're gonna say make vertex parents. And now anytime we rotate, that kneecap is gonna be attached to that shin bone. So now we've got that attached and then this will be attached sort of like a shin guard or a knee guard like this uh, when we move this around. So we'll do the same thing on this side. Jump into local view here right click on the kneecap, shift right click on the shin, and then make sure you select the proper vertices. And I, I'm having to select three in this case because I wanna make sure the kneecap is gonna rotate with the shin. And so if we only select one and do a vertex parent, it'll move with it, but it probably won't rotate. So let's hit control P, make a vertex parent, and there we go. Okay. So now you've got a little character, if you followed along, that you can animate uh, and practice animating with this little mannequin. And so I would recommend uh, finishing this out, trying to create a torso and maybe some arms and a head uh, that you can rig up. 
and starting to practice your character animation. And in this case, it's really simple. All you have to do is, uh, I'll just do a quick example. Um, you would basically pick a position on your timeline. We'll go to frame one and uh, let's go over to our properties panel over here. And I'm gonna animate one of these legs. So let's pick a starting position for this. Let me go ahead and save this as a new version here. And I'm gonna grab the, uh, the leg over here and start rotating these joints into place. And so what I wanna do is kind of kick. So let's pick these positions for this first uh, animation. And then the things that have moved, I want to keyframe. And so I'm gonna select everything on this side. Uh, I don't have to select the, uh, the kneecap because it's parented. Um, to the rest of the, uh, the, the shin here, and it's not ever gonna move. It's just attached like a solid piece of geometry, and it's never gonna shift around. Uh, and so I only need to actually keyframe these three limbs. So let's hit I once we have all of those selected, and I can pick what I wanna keyframe. In this case, I wanna keyframe the location and the rotation. And so you'll see all of those location and rotation uh, coordinates turn yellow, which tells you there's a keyframe. You'll also see a yellow keyframe in your timeline. And so now if I go forward maybe 24 seconds, because I think I'm on 24 seconds frame rate, then I want to position where the end position for this kick would be. So now we want to rotate out to here and then rotate this up and then rotate like this. You'll notice you need to kind of make sure you're rotating around in the proper axis so that everything's lined up like the human body would be. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get some really weird looking results with the way this is bending. And that's because we haven't set up any sort of intelligent uh, rig that lets Blender know that there's limitations on the way the body can move around, uh, which is possible. And again, we won't talk about that tonight but it's something you can get into if you are looking to animate in the future. Uh, so remember that you have the ability to rotate on uh, the axis of these. And so if, if you think the leg would kind of rotate around, you wanna try that. Do the same thing with individual limbs like that. And let's say that's good. We're gonna select the same three limbs that we just selected make sure we're on the right keyframe, and then we hit I, and then location and rotation. So now what you're gonna see is as we scrub through the timeline, we're gonna have that kick happen like this. And that's basically all you need to do to be able to start animating. So what I would probably do if I was gonna make this a little bit more dynamic is I would add some in-between poses. And so if I wanna add a little bit of a delay, we would uh, instead of just going from point A to point B like this, um, maybe I would start here and then I would draw back a little bit before I went back um, and kicked forward. And so maybe I copy the position here of all of these uh, things and we can actually go to the tools palette here and see if we can copy uh, where these are all in space might be able to do this. If I hit control C, maybe I can do it this way. Uh, so we can do this uh, one at a time. So we'll copy the location first. Whoops. Okay, I'm gonna do this a different way. Uh, we're just going to move this around. So we're gonna slide forward in time and then we're gonna reposition these again. So instead, I'm gonna come back even further. And then we're gonna again keyframe these with location and rotation. And so now what's gonna happen is you're gonna see it start here, pull back, and then go forward. And what you want is sort of a delay before he kicks, because you want the kick to be fast. And so we're gonna pull this back even further like this. And let's try to keyframe these again. And we can play with the dynamics a little bit in the graph editor, but basically you get kind of what I'm saying. You would want that to come up and maybe what you want to is to offset the way that the, uh, the elements are animated. 
And so real quick, uh, this is kind of getting off topic a little bit, but we got a lot of time. So uh, I'm going to show in the graph editor how you would sort of uh, play with these. So with, uh, let's not use the graph editor because we don't actually need to for this portion. Let's use the, the dope sheets uh, for this. And these are just going to let you slide the timing for your keyframes around. And so if I look through here, I can see all of the bones uh, that we keyframed. So we've got the uh, foot, the leg, and the shin. And then if you open this, you can see individual keyframes for all of the channels here as they are keyframes. And what you want to do is if you keep these collapsed, you'll be basically move the entire uh, keyframe lineup around all at the same time. And so that's what I want to do. I don't want to get into those individual frames at this point. But at this point, what I want to do is pull back. I want to come down. But at this point, I want the knee to still kind of be bent, like right around here. And so let's pick the, to do that, we would need to move the shin around. And so let's find where our timeline is right here. And we know that our shin was bent. So we need to just pull this back over here to uh, sort of have that bent there. And now there will be sort of a delay. So it's gonna come down, the leg's gonna swing forward, and then the shin's gonna come forward like this. And so you can also offset the way this happens with each of these limbs. And so a dynamic thing to do, uh, the foot needs to be last, but the leg would move first, then the uh, shin would move and the foot would come in at the end. So you're going to see these sort of whiplash into place and you would need to kind of spread these out to see the effect happen in a couple more frames there, but you can see what would happen like this. So that finishes offset. And that's how you start really getting in a little bit more. You can see the wave of how it comes down like that, and that's what you want to do. So that's a, a really basic primer for kind of how to start animating, but uh, you can do a lot better job on your own, and I would love to have you guys uh, share your animations with me so I can see those. Uh, so let's talk about the second example tonight. Uh, the sec second example is going to be uh, a different method, and we're going to use a modifier to help us create a rig. And this is actually an interesting way to go about doing this. So to get started, what we need to do is jump into our front view. And uh, for this particular example, I'm not even going to use uh, the mannequin or anything like that. I'm just going to add a new plane. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to the uh, modifier tab. And let's go ahead and add a skin modifier. So this is the method I actually used on the pipe. If you have seen some past live streams uh, and I was animate or uh, sculpting a pipe and the little guy that's stabbing the octopus on the pipe, um, that I use this method to create a really quick human uh, for that. And so what the skin modifier will do is automatically allow you to build uh, sort of a skeletal uh, structure for um, anything you need. It, it'll actually let you create an armature as well, which we'll, we'll see. So the way this works is basically every single corner uh, on this mesh is going to be part of a joint with the skin modifier. And so what I like to do first is I like to just kind of merge all of this down into one joint at the center. And that is going to give me my origin for my, um, for my human body or creature or whatever you're, you're doing here. And so you'll see that this one has a uh, red circle on the outline, and that is the root part of the skin here. And that's going to be important as we get in here and mess with this a little bit. So what you can do now is you can extrude out, hitting E on the keyboard the same way you would with any sort of mesh, and you can create the joints just using this method. So picture this as the left side of the body uh, from the character's perspective, right? Uh, so this is the left side of the hip, and then we're going to come down and create the leg down to the kneecap, and then we're going to come down again and create the shin, and then out from there, we're going to create the foot. So we would come out this way. And typically, as you get more and more into posing characters, uh, as you create them to be rigged and animated, you're going to understand uh, all the ins and outs of why you would do things a certain way with poses. But for now, uh, you want to kind of bend the knee a little bit because it creates a bit more of a natural posture when uh, the character is posed and uh, helps prevent some uh, problems that can occur if you make them really, really stiff when you're rigging it. 
So let's just bend the knee a little bit. Uh, obviously you would have a lot more joints in here if you want to do toes and uh, fingers and all that kind of stuff. But for now, let's keep it simple. And uh, what we can do is just grab all of these here. And then we just want to duplicate them and move them over to the other side. So I'm going to switch this back to the 3D cursor as the pivot point. Let's hit Shift D and then I'm going to scale with S and then I'm going to hit X and I'm going to type in negative one. And because we're using the 3D cursor as our pivot, that's going to move a duplicate uh, to the same distance out to the side on the opposite axis. Uh, and so now what we can do is right click on the top joint here, shift right click on the middle part, and then we just hit F and that will make a connection between those two, just like if you're modeling with geometry. Okay, so this, as you can tell, is kind of already looking like a joint system. And what's interesting about this is that our root has kind of moved down to the bottom of our toes, which is really not what we want in this case. Uh, the root is going to help determine how the armature is formed when we create it. Uh, and, and so this needs to sort of be centered in the middle here. So all you need to do to reposition this is right click on the uh, vertice that you want to be the root, and then just click mark root and it will move that to the right place. Now, another interesting thing about the skin um, modifier is that we can actually change the width of this uh, uh, skin so that it has variation. If I switch into shaded view, you can actually tell that it's creating some geometry for us as we are building out the skin. And so um, if you've ever used Z spheres and ZBrush, uh, this is the exact same principle. And so this is kind of what this is used for is to quickly get uh, an armature in place. And so what you can do is actually change the radius here and your properties on the X and Y, and you can drag these uh, and it will change these for you. Or what you can do is uh, kind of make these the same number. And then if you want to use the keyboard shortcut, it's just control A on the keyboard and that will let you sort of um, hit control A and then move your mouse around to get a proper size for this. And so what I like to do is just kind of work both sides up at the same time and it will automatically pick how much geometry needs to be uh, joining in between to make this work. So it's actually a really quick way to get a um, mesh created if you're trying to sculpt or something like that. And it's very, very handy for that sort of thing. So you can move this up here. If you want to make it smaller, you can again go the other way, shrink that down there. And now if we jump into object mode, you can see what we got. We got a basic human person. Uh, in the legs. Okay, so what's really powerful about this is that it will automatically create a skeletal armature for you, uh, which is the third method we're going to be talking about how to do manually, but uh, you can do it automatically using the skin modifier. And so once you've created your basic layout for your skin here and your skeleton, uh, if you jump into object mode, you can see this little button becomes active that says create armature. So if you click that, it's going to automatically create an armature. And an armature is Blender's methodology or Blender's terminology for uh, basically a skeleton. Uh, and so armatures are what is used to control all of the characters uh, that you would ever see in animated movies and things like that. Uh, and so it's the underlying uh, controls that actually morph the mesh and move you know, the skin around. So now that we have an armature, What's great about this method as well is that it automatically um, creates the armature, but it also attaches it to the skin that you just created. And so if we uh, right click on the armature now, instead of the skin that we were creating, uh, you'll see that we have an object that is totally separate from the original object. And this is our skeleton. So if we look into the modes down here, you'll see that now we only have edit mode and we have pose mode, which is a mode that we have never talked about before. Pose mode is a special mode used specifically for animating. And so if we switch into pose mode, uh, you can see that we now have the ability to select these bones individually, and they're gonna show up in a little bit of a different color than normal. And uh, this mode is primarily what you use for animation. And so you can right click on any of these bones like normal, and as you rotate, you'll see that the uh, skin, as it created the armature, automatically attached it for us to the mesh for us. Uh, and so this is a fantastic way to really quickly uh, get things in place for your characters. If you're trying to create something fast and you just wanna play around, 
skin method is a great method for this. Uh, so let's talk about some of the other options you're going to see as you start playing with armatures uh, and how they work. And so if you look at some of the menus over here with armatures, you're going to see different icons that you probably haven't ever seen before if you haven't played with this before. So let's jump over to the data section here for the armature. Uh, you'll see that you've got pose position and rest position. This has to do with as you're building out poses and a pose library for your characters, you want to start creating a rest position as you're making the armature. Uh, so that is a relaxed and sort of default position. As you click the rest position, it will always uh, sort of snap back to that default position. And then if you jump to the pose position, if you've moved anything around, it will stay in that position. So the rest position will snap back, pose position will go to the last uh, known pose there. You've also got layers that you can play with in terms of how, where your armature is showing up on uh, those. And so if you want to hide facial uh, armatures because you can have bones for the face that control just the lips or the eyelashes or uh, you know things like that, then you don't always want to have those visible because it can get confusing. And so this allows you to hide that stuff uh, and only show certain things at the same time. And so if you only want to animate the lower half of the body, that but would be sort of on one layer and then the upper body could be on another layer and then the facial features could be on another layer. And you've got all of these layers uh, here for that. You've also got the ability to change the way the bones sort of look. So typically this is the default uh, way they kind of looked before. Uh, and so now you'll see that you can switch between these. And uh, if you pr prefer working with uh, the way these uh, have uh, kind of changed here, you just need to go into this menu and pick one that you like working with. I like this one because it kind of shows visually where the hierarchy is uh, with the bones. So the joints are going to be little balls and then the uh, the bones are going to start at the root and they're going to be large. And as the uh, bones go down to the child bone, they are going to taper to a smaller point. And that tells me what direction the bones are flowing throughout the entire body, uh, which is really, really good. Uh, and so we've got a whole separate set of menus here for what to show. Each of the bones can be named and you turn on the names there and which axes they're pointing down, which can be um, very, very useful when you get into more advanced character rigs and you need to uh, limit the motion so that you know the knee can't be awkwardly extended like this because that would be a broken leg and you don't want that. Uh, and so you're going to need to be able to turn those on and off so you can see what direction those axes are pointing uh, for those purposes. Uh, you can create bone groups. You can create a pose library, which will let you save common poses. Uh, and so if you're doing a fight scene between two characters and you know you need to have different kicks and positions and specials and all that sort of stuff saved for maybe a game or whatever you're working on, uh, you would need to start creating a pose library because it would be very, very time consuming to have to reposition every bone in the human body. Uh, so this would let you have a starting position and then kind of tweak it as you go which is good. Ghosting is also very, very handy for animation purposes because it allows you to kind of uh, preview all the positions on the timeline for where your uh, bones and joints are moving throughout time. And so uh, again, we're not going to get into all that tonight, but I just wanted to show you guys some basics for the menus. You've got a special bone menu here for individual bones. You can see the name here. This will tell you the transformation. Locking has to do with what we were talking about, limiting motion, things like that. Um, and now we've got new bendy bones, which allows more cartoony effects where you can actually stretch and uh, curve bones and do all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, and so that is in this menu here. We also have a custom constraint menu just for bones. And so we haven't really talked about constraints on my channel for uh, the regular object constraints in Blender yet. Uh, but if you look here, you actually have bone constraints that are um, specific to the way that these work as well. And so this can be handy. Uh, you can imagine, you know, um, being able, again, to limit the motion, the range of motion, being able to have your kneecap always pointed in a certain direction forward, uh, which can be handy. So that's where uh, some of those cases come into place where you would use this, uh, as well as inverse kinematics, which is a more advanced uh, method for animating. Uh, so we can talk about that tonight because I think we're going to have time. All right. So the step uh, with the skin has actually saved you quite a bit of time because there's two parts to animate or rigging a character. Uh, rigging involves creating the armature, which is what we kind of did here automatically with the skin 
uh, modifier. Uh, but then it also involves attaching the character mesh to the armature itself because it's not always apparent to Blender uh, what vertices and what sections of the mesh are supposed to be controlled by what bones. As you can imagine, if you have a way more complex rig uh, and claws and fingers and everything, there's gonna be some overlap with the communication uh, for how Blender is trying to interact with those sections of the mesh, and it can be confusing. So uh, you're gonna see things not work out uh, when you first set up some meshes, and you're gonna need to know how to manually get in there and kind of tweak and play with the armature. So we're gonna talk about how to do that in the next example. So again, the great thing about this is uh, if we were gonna take this to the next level, we could go ahead and add a subsurf modifier. Uh, we can play a little bit more with our um, sizing here. And so get these kind of in place as far as the skin goes for our um, proportions here. And again, once you get this done, uh, what's great about this is you can actually just go ahead and uh, use it as a base mesh for sculpting and then come back and create the armature and quickly pose a sculpt. So if you were gonna do some conceptual, conceptual sculpting uh, really, really quickly, this would be a way to move that around without having to worry about rigging the entire thing up from scratch, uh, which is kind of what we're gonna talk about next. So once we have that set up there, uh, you can see again, it did a really good job of already attaching that to our mesh and uh, everything flows out from the root bone. And so the root bone will control everything as we saw in the mannequin example, everything here is going to uh, control out and down. As you can see, the hierarchy flows out from the center and then down the legs into the foot. And so this is now controlling the proper portions of the geometry. And so, uh, eventually you get to a point where when you're animating, you're gonna see this is an x-ray mode, and that means your bones are always gonna be on top, which is essential because uh, otherwise it's very, very hard to select the bones through the mesh. So if this is turned off, you're gonna see they go inside of the mesh, and that's not really what you want. So if that ever happens, uh, just head over into your object properties for your armature and make sure x-ray is checked off uh, because that will make it easy to select things. Jump into pose mode, and then just as before, you would go ahead and animate. So we jump into the zero position, pick a pose for the armature sections here, grab the uh, bones individually and make sure you're in pose mode here. And then you're gonna uh, insert, uh, in this case, you're just gonna keyframe the location, as you, so you can see is grayed out. And that's because you don't move the bones around, uh, they're just rotating in space. Because if we move the bones, uh, it won't even let me. If I try to move, it automatically starts rotating. Uh, and that's because it's attached to the hip here. And so it's uh, trying to realistically limit the ability that I have to uh, move this around in space. So we can hit inserts uh, with I, pick a, uh, just a rotation is what we want in this place. You don't want to actually keyframe more than you need to because it actually can break uh, what your expected behavior is for your animations. So make sure you're, you're kind of only doing what you need to do for those keyframes. In this case, we'll just keyframe all the rotation values, move forward about 24 seconds on the timeline, and then let's reposition uh, what this is gonna do. In this case, we're gonna go a little bit more into uh, what I would do for keyframing this up. So we're gonna go out to here, pull this down, and out like this, this is gonna be our second pose. And so I'm gonna click and select all three of these joints, hit I and then rotation is what I'm gonna choose. I'm gonna move forward a little bit more and this time I'm gonna use less keyframes because I want this to be faster. So we're gonna have this distance and then when it gets to here, I want the kick to be fast. So we're only gonna go a couple of keyframes this way. And then again, I'm gonna rotate out here, point the knee, extend the shin, and then the foot is gonna extend up here as well, okay? And then all three of these, insert rotation. So now what happens is if we play this back, make sure your timeline is set to playing all of the uh, portion that you want to show. We can jump out of pose mode into object mode. Let's turn off our x-ray so the bones aren't showing. And then we can just show our mesh here. 
So now if I play this, you can see that it starts kind of slow and then speeds up and it kicks, okay? And again, the important part that's different about this method is that the mesh is actually deforming. So if you look at the geometry, it's, it's bending because of the influence of the bones. And that's essentially what we're doing tonight is trying to get to this point. Uh, and so it's great that we have an automatic tool that lets us do this. There is actually a much more advanced automatic tool that lets us do this called Rigify. And it is a free add-on for Blender uh, that is fantastic. Uh, but tonight, since we're not going to do full characters and we're not talking about anything like that, uh, we won't get into Rigify because it's pretty advanced. Uh, but this is basically how you would do it with the skin modifier. So let's jump into the third example here. So we've got this little animation here. And now let's jump into section number three. All right. So now we've got a full character that we want to rig up. and. Since we're talking about the dragon last night and designing that, I figured we would do something kind of worm-like so that you guys would see possibly how we're going to build out the spine for the dragon in this case. Uh, so it looks like we have a question in the chat. Lauren says, in that skin modifier mode, uh, you did not tell Blender about the parenting. How did it know how to arrange the parenting? Uh, and so this is based on uh, weights. Uh, and distance between the bones and the mesh. And so it handles it automatically. Uh, if we look at the actual mesh that it's created for us, and we can't actually see the mesh right now unless we apply the skin modifier, but let's go ahead and apply the skin modifier. And now that we have that applied, you're gonna see we still have two uh, modifiers live now. We have a subsurf modifier, which we added ourselves. And then when we clicked create the armature in the skin modifier, it created an armature modifier. And this is basically going to make sure that these are connected to the mesh. You'll see that uh, we have some options for how it's binding our mesh to the bones. And right now we have vertex groups checked off. And so if we switch over into the data tab for our mesh object, you'll see under vertex groups, every single bone that we have that was created in the armature now has a vertex group. And so now what we can do is if we switch into weight panned mode, and we highlight any of these vertex groups, you can see that specific bones have specific sort of influence over the mesh based on the vertex group. So this is what's going on. When it creates the mesh, it automatically determines based on proximity how far away the bone is to other parts of the mesh based on a distance factor. And then it automatically tries to assign a, a vertex group uh, to those uh, parts of the mesh for you. And when it does that, hopefully it works out in such a way that it doesn't have any problems and it doesn't accidentally grab another part of the mesh that doesn't belong next to that bone. Sometimes you'll see that that can happen. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into this next example. Uh, but for now, just understand that anything in red is influenced by the bone underneath. Anything in blue is not influenced at all. And so interestingly enough, if I wanted to manually get in here and tweak this, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I could pick a bone and let's say in this case, I want to pick the foot bone. Let's see, there it is. Okay. So this is only supposed to be affecting the foot geometry, but if I want it to also affect uh, part of this other leg from the foot bone, I don't know why you would want it to do that, but you could, then I can actually paint that influence. And so we would basically go into our tools palette over here in white painting mode. I would make sure that my strength is turned up all the way to 1.0 uh, and the weight is uh, one, which is basically gonna make it a full connection for this red factor right here. And now when I paint, anything in red is starting to be affected by this bone. And so if I were to jump into uh, pose mode, make sure extra is turned on. And now when I rotate this foot, this leg will be affected. And so that is what's happening, is it's automatically trying to figure out what part of the mesh is connected based on that vertex group. And you can see that we can manually modify that for, uh, for good or bad. Okay, so let's talk about the third example, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how this works and how we can do it manually. Jump into the third layer here. You're gonna see that we have this, this little worm guy. 
Uh, just to give you an idea of what this model looks like, it's pretty basic. We've got a cylinder, and then towards the top, I created a sort of a head-like uh, structure just to give us an idea of what the front and the back looks like uh, so that we can animate it properly. And it's already configured in this sort of S-shape configuration. Now, this isn't the best way to um, you know, model this so that you can pose it. Ideally, if we were going to make a snake, we'd want it stretched all the way out in a straight line. So that way we could rig it really, really easily. Uh, but in this case, you'll see that because there's not any weird coiling or anything happening with overlap, uh, we probably won't have any problems. But I wanted to give you guys an example of a real character that you can animate. So this can go as complicated or as simple as you want it. Uh, you can do humans obviously the same way, but in this case, we're gonna be able to just create a basic spine uh, with bones and that's gonna be animated uh, here. So let's jump into top view. We're gonna manually create an armature now. So if you get a shift A or the tools palette and go to the creates over here and you'll see a uh, armature option down here under other. And you can also go to uh, shift A menu and then there is an armature section here. So you're gonna start off by creating a single bone and that's gonna get created where the 3D cursor is as you can see right here. Uh, so all you really need to do is treat this the same way you would a mesh. And so it's gonna be in object mode when you first insert the armature. You can jump into edit mode. And now what will happen is in uh, edit mode, you can grab the middle of the bone and move the whole thing around, or you can grab one piece and move that around. And you'll see the bone automatically grows and shrinks based on the endpoints uh, that you have here. So the root, is the part with the big end and the tail is the part with the small end. And uh, that terminology is kind of important because Blender uses that uh, in the program. So let's uh, kind of jump into the front view here. We don't want this to be pointing up. We want the uh, bones to be going side to side. So let's rotate this um, over 90 degrees in the negative direction. And then I wanna start with the roots by the head up here because the head is gonna kind of move first and then it's going to get, uh, kind of wiggle down the body and control the rest of the joints as we're creating this. So let's switch into wireframe view here. Let's move the root bone up to the head over here and I'm gonna switch out of rotation around the 3D cursor back to the median points so we can get this into place. So I'm gonna start the bone in the neck sort of right around here I'm gonna grab the endpoint, and then I want to uh, pull it over to there. So let's turn on X-ray and then keep drawing as we need to here. So we'll start over here on the right side, hit E, and then every time there's like any shift in the geometry and the curvature, we want to create sort of a, another joint here. And so the goal for this particular uh, creature because the body is pretty much uh, similar all the way down, it's gonna be to maintain the same sort of distance. Uh, again, this is a lot easier if the snake is already straight, but in this case, uh, we can also make this work like this. So I'm just gonna eyeball kind of the way these need to look. It doesn't have to be perfect, um, but obviously the more joints you create, the more you're gonna have to animate, so keep that in mind. Uh, and let's just finish this out over here. Okay, so once we have a chain of these running all the way down, uh, we basically already have our armature completed and we don't really need any other uh, crazy things happening. So we can jump out of edit mode. We need to make sure that from the other angles, this is actually going through the center of the snake. We don't want it to uh, kind of be going outside at any point in time. So if we look at the front view, you can see that the snake is actually tapering down towards the ground in the background. Uh, and we need to adjust the bones to do the same thing. So let's jump back into edit mode. Let's grab, uh, starting with this bone, let's move it down a little bit, and I'm just going to grab the tips of the rest of these so we can automatically shift these down as well and just quickly kind of position these into an ever-descending location on the tail like that. This one might even need to come up so where it's more in the center of the neck there. And so let's also mimic that same positioning that way. Okay, 
So now we should have everything kind of centered in the middle of the snake's body. Jump into object mode and talk about how to start getting this connected to the snake. Okay, so we saw before that on the skin, when we created the armature, it automatically created an armature modifier. Uh, so basically if we jump into the character object over here, go to the tools palette, we can add a modifier that is an armature modifier. That is the first one under deform. Uh, and so what it's gonna say is, which object do you want to create an armature for? And uh, in this case, it's gonna say armature object to deform with. We can open this menu, pick which armature we want, or you can use the eyedropper tool and drop it onto this armature here. And then it's gonna ask you uh, what method do you want to use to bind the armature uh, or the mesh in this case to the armature. Uh, so you can use vertex groups, which we just talked about. You can use bone envelopes, uh, which is another way to display the um, bones here. So if we jump into the bone menu, uh, let's see here, then you can see envelopes is one of the options. And so envelopes will let you know uh, based on the selection here in edit mode, uh, the little outside outline that's sort of transparent uh, is the in outside envelope, and that will tell you what's controlling that part of the mesh. And so this is just another uh, way to sort of tell Blender how to influence your mesh here. Um, so let's jump out of edit mode, back into our armature, and then uh, so these are the two primary methods. Uh, obviously, you've got this, which will allow you to pick a vertex group, uh, that only controls part of the mesh. And so if you wanna have multiple armatures that are separated uh, for different parts of a complicated you know, robot or something like that, so then you could actually select multi-modifier and then uh, add multiple armatures on top of each other, which would let you stack the effect one on top of the other. So a little bit more complicated, but uh, tonight we're gonna use vertex groups. So we'll keep this checked off. Looks like in the chat we got a question. Brandon, could you turn on that function that shows your keystrokes and your mouse buttons? Yes, I can. So let's jump into screencast keys. So lower left-hand corner will show you uh, kind of what is happening uh, down here for my keystrokes, if that helps. Uh, and let's talk about how to get this bound to our mesh now. So I'm gonna go back to this menu Change this back to, uh, let's pick sticks. Yeah, let's pick sticks in this case. Uh, and so uh, it's it starts with parenting in the same exact way as we had before. Uh, we'll pick our armature, we'll shift right click and pick the mesh, hit control P. And uh, again, you're gonna see set parents uh, to objects and actually we need to go the other way. So we're gonna select our mesh first, then we're gonna select the armature. And now if we control P, we'll see other options. And you'll see armature deform, and you'll see options for, again, how to deform. You can use weights. Uh, and then automatic weights, will again try to assign those the way the skin modifier did for you. Uh, so you could try that and might get lucky and have it all work out perfectly. Or you can do it with empty groups, paint your own weights uh, to try to do that with uh, the vertex groups. Uh, and we'll try both. So let's start with automatic weights and see how this is going to work for us. So if we jump into pose mode now, you can see what will happen if we select each of these and rotate. And what I like to do once I have an armature that's bound to my mesh is I like to select my mesh in the outliner and once I have that uh, showing, I like to disable the selection uh, little icon here so that I can't accidentally select this while I'm posing my, my stuff. And there's really no need to select the character anymore once you are animating. Uh, you just need to move the skeleton around. So we uh, can always turn this back on or off, but if we have this disabled, we can't actually right click and select the character in the viewport. Uh, so now we can just animate and we can go through and rotate this around and make sure that we're happy with the way it's deforming our character. Looks like because of the simplicity of this character, we're not gonna have any huge issues this time around. But it's always good to go through and check to make sure. So it's, uh, it's gonna get a little weird the way it's deforming the more you try to bend this. Uh, and that happens a lot with automatic weighting because it, it's just averaging between the joints, the influence down the length of your um, 
your object here. And so what you really want to start doing as you get more into characters that have, you know, uh, things like the arms and joints connected to the rest of the torso, where you're going to have overlapping skin and stuff like that when people fold their arms down, uh, you're going to have to manually get in there and paint the weights. And so let's talk about how that works. Uh, I'm going to jump into the object mode again. So Alt B, Alt P, and we're going to clear the parent inverse like this. Uh, actually, let's just clear the parent. There we go. So now the armature is back to the way it used to be by itself, and our snake is here by itself. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about uh, what we have is we have all these vertex groups that were automatically created. Let's just clear all these out. So we're back to where we were before. Uh, so once again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to right click on the character first, shift right click on the armature, and we're going to hit control P. And now this time we're going to choose with empty groups and click OK. So now when we try to pose this, it's not going to move anything around because nothing has been connected to the bones yet. And this is where we get into the process of what's called skinning, which is separate, separate from the skin modifier that you see in Blender. Skinning is the second part of the process when it comes to rigging, where you were actually talking about the process of how you attach the mesh to the bones individually. And so there's a whole art just to this side of character creation when you're talking about animation. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about that tonight as we get in here and try to skin this. Uh, so to get started, what we're gonna need to do is jump into edit mode for uh, or actually we need to grab our uh, character over here. You're gonna see that all of these bone groups for vertex groups were added back to the character based on the names of the bones individually uh, that we have here. So if I were to turn on the names, you can see each one of these has uh, a name and they're ascending. So it starts with bone, then bone 001, 002, 003, all the way down to the end. And each of these has to be the exact same name in the vertex group on the object, uh, which is done for you automatically. So now that we have uh, all of our bones here, and typically you would have these labeled on a human body like we did before. You would have the hip and the, the right leg, the left leg, obviously all of that. So it's easier to tell what's what. Uh, but now we know uh, that this is gonna be the front of our object all the way down the spine to the very tail down here. Uh, and we need to get in here and actually paint the weights. So to do that, we need to jump into weight paint mode with our object selected. You're gonna see it starts off as all blue. And so what we're gonna do is basically go one by one through each of these bones, and we're gonna tell Blender uh, what part of the body to move based on this bone. Uh, and so again, I wouldn't recommend doing this on a regular basis because there's automatic ways to handle this. Uh, again, Rigify is a great way and a great tool that's a, an add-on that helps you do this for characters. Uh, that works automatically. It also creates a really advanced rig for you to use uh, with adv advanced controls and things for your character. So there's better ways to do this than uh, the way I'm about to show you. But I, I need to show you <clears throat> how to do what we're about to do because if anything ever breaks, you kind of need to know how to fix it. And so that's the purpose of doing what we're about to do. Uh, in the old days, you would have to do all this by hand. But now uh, we have a lot of amazing tools to help do this. So. It's gonna start by basically just getting in here and painting. Uh, we can pick draw, and then again, set our weight to one, strength all the way up. And if you got a tablet, same as for sculpting, you can paint here. It's the same keyboard shortcuts. So F will control the size or the radius of your brush. Uh, Shift F will control the strength and the weight you can control here. So zero is gonna be the blue, which means there's no effect on the uh, skin one is going to be 100 percent effects and you can also blend in between at any of these decimal point values so we'll start with one and for make sure we're under the right vertex group for the top bone in the head over here we're going to say everything up here needs to be affected and so we're going to paint all of this in over here okay and I want to go down to where it starts to come into this other joint, and then I want to kind of stop once we hit that section. All right, so now we jump down to bone one, which is right here. And it's hard to kind of see these, uh, uh, these labels, but that's where the bone one is there. And so now we want to paint in everything that's going to affect 
uh, every part of the mesh that's going to be affected by this bone one section. Okay. So now if I go to bone two, do the same thing, and I'm not going to do the whole thing uh, and, and, you know, kind of talk all about it because, it, you know, there's really no point after you see the first two or three uh, to hear me and watch me do the whole thing, but you guys get the idea. Uh, this is what you need to do to, to skin the whole character. Uh, so now that we got all three of these bones into place, we can jump back into object mode, grab our uh, armature here, jump into pose mode, and now we will see that it starts to influence things. So every part that is not connected is gonna stay in place that we haven't painted yet. And you'll see that it kind of breaks uh, the skin at that point. But everything that is connected is working appropriately. Now, what you'll start to see if it's not uh, painted correctly is again, it's gonna start affecting things up here that it shouldn't. And you wanna start minimizing that effect. And so what you would do is you would jump back into weight mode and we can say, okay, well, everything next to this bone, we definitely want it to affect that. So we'll leave that up at one. But now we want to say, we need to taper this off. So we can uh, move this down and say anything up here, let's move this down to a much, much lower uh, weight so that it's not going to affect this stuff. So let's taper this off up here. Okay. And now if we jump back into pose mode, you should be able to see that it has less of an effect as it than it did before. It's less broken. Um, yeah, so Lauren's saying she remembers that I did the weight painting when we were attaching the octopus arm. So uh, weight painting is the same exact thing uh, that you would use to paint any vertex group. And so when we were trying to use a shrink wrap modifier to flatten the bottom of the octopus, uh, we needed to uh, tell Blender what part of the weight uh, the what part of the vertex group was uh, the flat part of the, the bottom of the mesh. And so, uh, yeah, we painted a weight painting to do the same thing. And you have to remember the weight painting is just a visual representation of all of the, the values on the surface. And so it's here for you to visually be able to read with a map and tell what's being affected with a vertex group. Because essentially with a vertex group, uh, if we look in edit mode, sorry, edit mode, uh, you've got weights the same as you had in weight paint mode, the weights are down here. And so if we look at certain vertices uh, for the vertex groups, each of these has an individual value uh, for the weights here. And so I'm not sure if you can actually see these. Uh, yeah, you can here. So every vertex weight in edit mode is listed under the properties menu. And you can see all the values individually. If you right click on each of these individual vertices, it'll tell you how much uh, weight is being affected by which vertex groups. And so uh, bone one has a 100% effect on this vertice. Bone two, which is down here, has a 32% effect on this vertex. And again, it's very, very hard to visually kind of get that um, going without seeing it on the on the surface of your mesh. And so rather than having you mess with all the numbers, it's just letting you visually kind of represent that with uh, this, this red and blue map that you see here. Uh, so yeah, that's all you got to do. And if you look at uh, the individual um, vertex groups as you automatically do the painting with the automatic selections, uh, for binding to the skeleton here, you can, again, cycle through all of those individual vertex groups and see that it, uh, you know, basically just fades from one bone to the next as you go down the list. Uh, so that, yeah, that's basically all you need to do to get in here and do an advanced sort of mesh. Uh, so to kind of smooth these out, there's also like a blur tool in here. And so this is what I kind of use when I want to taper off the effects from one to the next. And so what's great about this is I can be in weight paint mode and still rotate this bone at the same time so I can see what's going on. And so now, because I know that I don't want this bone down here to be affecting anything up here, I can start to blur this line and it will start to kind of taper off the effects a little bit. So one of the things you can do is blur it. The other thing you can do is uh, use the subtraction tool. So now if we rotate, you'll see it has less of an effect up here, but it's kind of extended that. So we can go grab the subtract tool 
We want to bring the strength down uh, to something smaller over here. And then we can make our brush bigger. But we want to very, very, um, you know, gently start to pull out the effectiveness of this bone back here on these surfaces up here. And this lets you do that in small increments, as you can see. And so now, if we start to rotate, you can see that we have less and less of an effect. And it's just kind of a game of playing with um, the blur tool and the subtract tool a little bit at a time until you start to taper this off in such a way that it's pleasing to your eye. And there's really no um, you know, hard set number I can give you for how you need to do this so it can be effective. Uh, all I can tell you is that it, it depends on the character and it depends on the, the animation that you're creating because uh, it's about range of motion. And so sometimes if there doesn't need to be a lot of movement, uh, you can get away with a lot of stuff. But if the, you know, obviously you don't want the arms to be moving and then other vertices from other parts of the body to be moving with it. So uh, that'll break the effect definitely. So again, get back in here and we can just blur this. And the idea is to get a really, really, really smooth taper from each bone uh, from one section down to the other on both sides. And that way, you're not going to get any of those really sharp pinching uh, things happening as you're animating your character. So you can see that line is getting really, really shallow uh, in terms of the way that it tapers as I blur this. And we may not even need each bone to have 100% effectiveness. Uh, on the mesh. And so if it doesn't, you can just come in here and head towards red with these sections. So maybe the middle of it is the only section that really kind of gets a red hue and then it's really quickly tapering off on the sides. So now if we check this, you can see what that's doing here. Okay. And again, if you're getting a really sharp problem, you need to blur that edge. There we go. So we've got a thing going on up here. Blur this. Now you can see up here, we don't have any problems anymore with it animating. There's no pinching. And so that's what you got to do manually all the way down the character. And so tonight, uh, the description again has a, a download that has all of this in it. And so if you want to go back through at some point and follow along with everything that we talked about, uh, I would highly recommend doing that and manually painting and trying this out on your own skeleton. You don't have to do as many bones as I have here, uh, but learning how to tweak and fix problems that are in these uh, white painted maps will help you rig a character that's a lot more advanced down the line. Uh, so we got about 40 minutes left. Is there anything you guys specifically want to talk about or have questions about in the chat? Uh, I will go ahead and answer those and then we can decide what else we want to do uh, till nine. I got through that fast. Wasn't expecting to get through it that fast. So yeah, I can keep painting the octa or the uh, <laughs> snake here in terms of the weights and show you guys how to keep doing that. Uh, but it's pretty monotonous and the same sort of thing. It's tedious work. Uh, or we can keep modeling parts of the mannequin, which I don't mind doing. Uh, and then if you want, I can go ahead and upload this other file so you guys can play with that as well. Uh, or we can just animate, that might be fun. You guys wanna see some more animation? Okay, uh, Lauren's saying she wants me to animate, so that's what we will do. 
All right, so uh, if you get to a point where any of your animation, um, you know, armature bones or anything are way out of whack, uh, what you can do quickly to get them back into place is to just reset the rotations and the locations or whatever. Uh, rotation is the only thing you should really have to reset. Uh, you shouldn't be moving the, the bones around. But um, so to do that, you can select everything on your armature. And if you hit Alt R, that will clear all of the rotation. Uh, and so that will get that back into place. Now, in this case, we need to kind of see what has happened here. So not sure what uh, kind of went on there. Okay. I also did not clear my scale. So it says it's a negative one on the x-axis on these. Uh, which is not something I want to have around. Now, when they, when you hit Control A to apply the scale, so the zeros back out to one, one, and one, uh, it's going to flip the normals, which always happens. So all you have to do is jump into edit mode and then select everything and hit Control N to flip the normals back out to the outside. Uh, and so if that ever happens to you, like again, the scale is completely wrong. So we need to apply this, flip that. Same thing here. There we go. Wow, it's all sorts of jacked up. All right, I'm gonna delete all of this. Uh, and then let's clear all of the animation that we currently have on this right here. So I'm gonna select all of the keyframes. Let's delete these. Uh, Lauren says, when you wait pan, it seems like each section's panning might contradict the panning of the adjoining sections. Uh, and so, yeah, that can happen. If you get two sections that are saying it has 100% influence on a section, you're going to get some weird results. Uh, and so the idea is to get a really, really smooth transition between one. So between a 100% and a 100% weight for two bones, you want to go back down to uh, some sort of average in between and then make sure you're uh, smoothly tapering between each of those. Uh, and the reason that manually doing that is important is because sometimes um, you want multiple bones to influence one part of the body. Uh, and, and obviously that doesn't always happen in the human body. Uh, but when you're talking about a creature, for example, you might want one section of the anatomy as it moves, like a shoulder or something, to control not only an arm uh, or something on the upper torso, but what if it has wings connected in the back? You need to have the first joint for the wings to kind of move and rotate as well and be influenced by one bone as it moves. And so that's where you would get into more advanced rigging and needing to custom weight paint your stuff up. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm gonna try to fix this kneecap here because I don't know why it is rotating into a weird position. So I may not have applied the rotation in this case uh, when we did that vertex parent. So let's hit control A and apply the rotation here. And then check to make sure that's still working. Okay. Uh, Lauren's saying, can you show us on the snake how you show the painting on two adjoining sections? Uh, I'm not sure if you can pull both up at the same time. Uh, so let me jump back over here to our snake. See the vertex sections here. Yeah, so if I shift click, I can't select more than one of these at the same time. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sure there's a good reason for that, probably because if we try to do that and you started painting, uh, it, would, it would get confusing what group it gets assigned to what, uh, or if they both did. So um, as far as I know, there's not a way to select both of these. Uh, but that's something I would do a little bit of research on and see what you can find because uh, there may very well be a way to turn an option that lets you select two groups at the same time. Uh, if we try to select multiple bones, um, that might show, no, see it's still only showing one vertex group. So uh, yeah, there may be a way to do it, not that I know of, but uh, as you kind of paint from one section to another, the best way to tell what's working and what's not working is to uh, position your mesh into a uh, pose 
that has sort of got it into a place that is deforming it so that you can see where all the problems are. Because then you can leave this in this certain pose here. And so if it was a human, you'd want it to be in a really extreme sort of action pose. And then you would be able to see well, like, okay, well, if it's punch, if this guy's punching or this girl's punching uh, and it's, it's not working because the arm's doing a weird thing, then I, I know that in this position I have to fix it uh, here. And then the only thing you have to worry about is when you go back to the rest position, does everything still look uh, fine the way that it is in the rest position? It's a, it's, it's a good tug of war. You know, you have to play with it a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is what you need to do. Um, Lauren's asking, wouldn't you need to show two adjoining sections to see the smooth transition of paints? Uh, possibly, but again, it's more about um, making sure that when it deforms into a certain position, that you're actually seeing the deformation uh, happen correctly. And so the weight part is not nearly as important as the effect of the weight paint. Uh, and so I would be much more interested in uh, you know, the rest of how this is not deforming properly uh, based on the way that this is kind of painted. And so one of the things you can do to kind of get started with the rest of this is uh, jump into these other bones. And then if you want to, you can, um, you can fill a section with uh, a color. And so uh, for everything in this section, you would have to do this in edit mode instead of uh, weight paint mode. But you could basically say, for each of these, I'm gonna select every piece of the mesh, and then I'm gonna say, I want this to all have an effective weight of one, and then I can say assign. And that way, when I jump back into um, weight paint mode, and I jump to this vertex group, the whole thing is already at a full effectiveness, and now I'm just painting away what doesn't need to have an influence. And so, this may be a little easier to understand, uh, then doing it the other way. So if it helps, you can do it this way. Um, but we'd say, let's turn the weight down to zero, let's turn the strength all the way up. And then we go, okay, so anything not next to this, we can just kind of get rid of and start uh, getting getting this taken back out. Uh, but the rest of this stuff, we need to uh, start um, sort of dialing this in here. And so you'll see it automatically update in the 3D viewport as you're painting away which will let you know that you've done what you should do to get rid of all of these. And the hard part about this is that you're, it's easy to miss a vertex um, as you're painting this way. And so you wanna make sure you're kind of paying attention to everything as you're rotating around. Uh, but in this case, we don't even need any of this stuff. And as we get closer and closer, maybe we switch to a blur and we just start uh, tapering this off a little bit at a time, like this. Uh, now we don't want the head to be affected by this here, so we'll take that down to probably a zero, but then again, after that, we're gonna wanna blur again until this smooths out and you're not getting any massive deformations happening like we are here. And this is the best, again, the best way I can tell you uh, from experience when we're animating characters um, and rigging stuff, how to tell if it's gonna work or not. And don't go so much off the weight map itself because that's not gonna tell you enough to let you know if it's gonna work, uh, but go off of you know how it's deforming the mesh uh, as you're painting this sort of stuff. Uh, there we go. And again, the dangerous part about filling the whole thing with the value of one and then going back in and, and undoing what you did is it's easy to miss a vertex and then you're gonna accidentally have a deformation out here somewhere. Uh, so just pay attention if you're gonna use this method of sort of averaging what's going on here. I'm gonna turn the, got the strength up all the way. Oh, okay, so this will do it. Multi-weight, I've never used this before. Uh, so maybe this will allow you to paint multiple sections. Yeah, that'll do it. 
Okay, so there's the answer to your question. Uh, click on multi-paint as the option, and now when you select multiple bones, it'll tell you the average weight between both, and then you can paint the influence, uh, influence here. So this is what you would need to do to make this work. So in this case, we would select these two bones, and then I go for the average. I don't want any influence. And uh, yeah, that's what you would have to do. Okay, so you guys, uh, do you still want to see me animate or do you want me to keep uh, weight painting? Okay, here's an example of it kind of going crazy on us, so we need to pay attention to that. Uh, yeah, so that's the idea. As you do the weight painting, uh, it should start to deform as you go. Um, again, may not always work perfectly, but it should kind of give you what you need. Okay, so let's see what we got. All right, so there's an example of where we accidentally uh, left something attached down here on this bone. So we need to then jump into uh, vertex mode and we either paint it away or if we jump into the actual uh, edit mode for the mesh, we can select all the vertices down at this end and manually uh, assign a weight of zero to those vertices. So now uh, nothing will have an influence on that portion if it's uh, been assigned correctly. So I'm gonna switch back to our default view here. And let's see what's going on. Okay, so.
Okay, it's bone three. We got the influence there. So we don't want that. So let's assign zero for that. Now you can see that it's gone. Except for one little section down here. <laughs> Lauren says she wants to see the snake animate. So let's see if we can get this done in time to do a little snake animation. All right, so we got a problem. We got a bone that is influencing an incorrect part of the mesh. And the problem is we need to figure out which bone is the, corp the culprit. Uh, so one of these is doing it and we should be able to tell which one as we look down here towards the end and it looks like it's the head bone, possibly. It's a little hard to tell. Uh, but again, the easiest way to do this is to do it manually. Uh, if you don't want any sort of influence at all, just switch into edit mode and do it from there. So at this point in time, we haven't really set any bone except for this last bone needs to have any influence. So starting with this one, we really just need to go through each of the vertex groups and make sure that uh, everything here on the end is not using uh, a weight higher than zero. Uh, so let's jump into bone nine, which we can double check is this bone here, should not be influencing the tip at all. And in this vertex group, let's set the weight down to zero, assign, eight assign, seven assign, six assign, five assign, four assign, three assign. Two assign, one assign, and the head should not affect it at all. All right, so that should have taken care of this problem, but it does not look like it did. Let's go ahead and also remove the last group from this section. So that's working in terms of the last bone that's, that's there. Okay, so I assume the rest of these will be fine. Let's test this. So even though it's deforming properly with most of these bones, all it would take is an improper value to be assigned in one of these vertex groups for this to start deforming in a weird way. Uh, so again, you just need to kind of make sure that you've troubleshooted what you need to to get these into place. So I'm probably not going to be able to manually correct every bone in time to animate this tonight, uh, but I'll go ahead and do a little bit of an animation so that we can see this moving. Uh, so if there's anything else major we should correct, let's go ahead and try to do it in this upper portion. And for all this stuff, I'm just gonna go ahead and blur. So I don't want it to affect anything up here. So we'll make sure we clear all of that. So 
the head should stay pretty much undeformed for this second bone, and this first bone should deform all of it. Okay. Moving down the body, again, we don't really want any deformation this high up, so let's clear all of that. Want a little bit of a transition, so we'll just click a couple of times to blur that value so that it doesn't just give a straight line transition for us. So you can see how that e more easily morphs in a better, more pleasing way there. And that's kind of what we want, so. Something like that. Okay, and then we'll move down to here. Again, we've got some movement in the head, which is definitely not correct. So we need to get rid of all of that. Also got some movement in here, which is not really what we want. Okay. It's a little easier to get away with uh, the tapering further down the body because the only thing that you really don't want to morph with the snake is the head. Uh, so the rest of this, as you blur, you should see a pretty forgiving transition when you try to deform the body here. Uh, but if it gets too high up, again, you don't want that to be influencing everything. So you want to pull this back out. If it's more than one bone ahead of the next one, uh, yeah, get rid of that, that influence. That's good. Okay, we'll blur a little bit here. So it's the same basic process all the way down. I'm doing a little bit of a blur that's going a little too far for my taste. And then I'm coming back a little bit with a, um, a mixed brush that has a weight of zero, but the strength is down to about 38%, which is tapering this off. So it's not such a harsh cutoff. Um, and I'm, I'm using transparent strokes basically to taper this value off. So it's not gonna, you know, just, eat into the, uh, the deformation on the mesh there. So we're almost done here. Let's see if I can wrap this up. This will be the exact same process that I used to do the dragon's uh, main body uh, for that part of the project. And so if you understand the mechanics of what we're doing tonight and get to that point, then you can basically uh, follow along with what I'll be doing for the dragon projects. It's going to get more complicated with the wings and the arms and, and everything, but for the most part, it's kind of the same as this. Okay, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, Lauren's asking if I used uh, much smaller bones, then would there be less deformation? Uh, so if we used, I don't know if smaller is the right word. In this case, the only way to get smaller bones would be to use more bones. Uh, and so you're going to have the same problem. Uh, and in this case, it's exactly the same situation when you're modeling 
um, you know, objects and you don't want to use a lot of extra geometry if you don't need to. When you're animating, you don't want to add more bones than are necessary to effectively deform the objects and get it into a position that it needs to be in. So even if you could more easily uh, get it to morph uh, using more bones that are shorter distances together, if it takes 10 times longer to animate, then you got to ask yourself if it's really worth the extra time and effort uh, than to just wait paint it correctly the first time through. It takes a little bit more time to set this up, but then you've got this all uh, configured in such a way that it's not going to break on you. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now everything's kind of working in place. It's not perfect. We've got some sections towards the top that need some work still. Most of the midsection is kind of doing what it needs to do. Uh, but let's talk about uh, a more advanced technique. Uh, we're not going to be able to get a lot into this tonight, but rather than having to animate all of these bones one by one, uh, we can use a more advanced animation technique to help us out with this. Uh, so I'll probably get a lot of questions from you guys if you're not familiar with it in terms of how it works. It's a very complicated topic, and so I can't get into a lot of details tonight because we would need more time and uh, we're, we're the science behind it is is complicated, uh, but I can show you how to set it up uh, pretty easily. So if you want to use it, uh, it's here and basically you can go to the constraints tab uh, and then select a bone. If you jump into the constraint, you can add an inverse kinematics um, constraint here. It's going to kind of automatically set this up. So I picked the last bone in the body and it automatically shoots it up to the root bone, which is the first bone we extruded from at the top. And now uh, this allows me to grab the last part of the mesh and it automatically um, uses an algorithm to determine the positioning in between uh, for all the other bones that are connected in that part of the mesh. So the most primary um, use of this sort of technique uh, is for when you want a character to interact with an object. Uh, so if you think about an, a character drawing a sword that's on his belt and pulling it out or catching a ball that's flying through the air, uh, trying to line up the animation to where the timing is perfect for an object to interact with a character's uh, body would be extremely difficult to do. It's also extremely difficult to manage the and maintain temporary connections between two objects uh, that are in a scene. So if uh, you have a character that has a permanent human body skeletal structure in place, um, you know, Blender has an easy time keeping track of uh, the parenting and the hierarchy and the attachment of the skin and all of that stuff. But the second you say, okay, I want this person to catch this ball, and now I want this ball to automatically be parented to the hand of my character, but only until he puts it down on the table, you have to keep up with that and it gets a lot more hard to manage as an animator. And so inverse kinematics allows you to basically use not only the movement to uh, and skip over uh, the manual animation of all these other bones, but it allows you to take an endpoint and basically um, attach it to an object and then override all of the other, uh, we call it forward kinematic uh, animation techniques. And so forward kinematics is basically you rotating one hierarchical bone after another into place, and uh, that's forward kinematics. Inverse kinematics is going the opposite direction. So we start at the tail instead of the head, and we animate this way. And so if you wanted to move the ball through the air and animate that, and then you wanted to make sure your character is gonna catch it at the right moment of the arc, uh, at the right time in the animation, you would basically say, all right, at this point in time, I need, I need the character's hand or whatever to be in this position. So you would move the character's hand to that position, uh, and then you would say, all right, we're gonna keyframe the influence of the inverse kinematics. So we're gonna hit I to keyframe that. And then back over here, I want to um, reposition this over here. Uh, but to do that, I basically just need to turn the influence back down to zero. So now, if this influence is all the way down, it's not going to let me just drag this over anymore because I've turned off the inverse kinematics. Uh, and so, again, as we move this up, I can, I can move this around and it's fine. And uh, keyframe this, but as we turn this off, 
we're back to the old method of moving things around uh, with the bones. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That's another method that you can keep under your hat for animating. Uh, it's very, very useful. And a lot of people overuse it. Uh, so it doesn't mean that you need to replace this for everything that you ever animate. Uh, forward kinematics is still extremely useful in most situations. Uh, but it all depends on the goal of the animation, the character you're using, what type of movement's happening in the scene, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, use it wisely and learn when it's appropriate to use it. Uh, there's also a lot of other settings you can go through here uh, for how to make this work. But a uh, basic idea here is to say, uh, in this position, we're going to have the influence uh, be out to here. We want the, the snake to curl up or something. We'll have the influence be at one out here. We want the influence to be uh, at zero, but we want it to be all stretched out. So we'll start with it in the right position, take the influence all the way down to zero, and we'll insert another keyframe there. And so now what happens when you transition between these two is it will uh, kind of remember where things are in place. And this only changes the effectiveness of the inverse kinematics. It won't automatically keyframe the rest of your your uh, skeletal structure. So remember that. So when you uh, have everything already in place out here, make sure you select all of your bones. And at that point, you insert keyframes for the rotation on all of these. And then when you're back over here and you have uh, the inverse kinematics off, when it's already stretched out here, once again, insert a keyframe for all of your bones and make sure this is down and keyframed as well. And so that will automatically allow you to animate between those two like this. So doing this manually would have taken quite a bit of time because we would have had to uh, you know, jump to this last keyframe and then I would have had to rotate all of those bones into place one by one. Um, so we can use this in this case to help us like try to get this into a place where it's slithering along. Uh, and so using this, if we play with the chain length, you can see that this will go up to a certain bone count from the last one all the way up. And that's sort of where the inverse kinematic effect stops. So in this particular case, if we don't want it to affect the head, uh, we can say go up to the next to last bone maybe, and then stop right there. And that won't affect any, anything with the head. You can also do uh, weight positioning with effectiveness or uh, rotational positioning as well turned on. Uh, so you can play with that. You've got options here to allow inverse kinematics to go over and beyond the limitation of your structure uh, and stretch out further and beyond. So that'll let you pull further out uh, if you have a rig that will let you do that. And uh, so there are a lot of things to play with uh, with these. Um, but here's where you would pick a target object. So if the baseball is flying through the air and you wanted someone's arm uh, with this bone to go towards the baseball, you would pick the baseball as your object and that's what you would influence in terms of whether it's heading that direction or not and catching it. Uh, and so that's how you'd animate that. So let me do a quick animation here and we will uh, try to get this into place a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the keyframes on the influence. Let's turn this all the way up. Let's start with it kind of coiled up over here. You'll notice also uh, with inverse kinematics turned on that it's going to be a little hard to uh, kind of get the rest of this into place while it's fighting against itself. Uh, so you kind of have to pay attention to when you need to turn the influence up or, or off. Uh, if you're not using this in uh, you know, the way it's kind of intended, it can give you some weird effects with the way that it goes towards objects with targeting. Uh, so just pay attention to that and make sure you're, you're off if you need to be off. One of the interesting things you can also do with your rig if you want to is you can select all of your bones and um, you have a specials menu if you use the W commands, and it lets you kind of flip the direction if you're in edit mode. So if we jump in edit mode here and we hit switch direction, it will change the uh, roots of these bones here. So let's jump over to our 
uh, armature menu. And let's change this back to octahedral. And you'll notice now they're headed the opposite direction. So they were headed this way, now they're headed this way. And that means uh, the hierarchy is shifted. So now it's going to automatically go the other way. So because we already had this weight painted and everything, it's going to kind of mess things up here. But if you needed to flip the direction of your bones as you're working on things uh, for certain parts of your mesh, just know that that's possible uh, when you're in edit mode. So let's flip those back and let's go back to animation. OK. So I want to kind of get this up here. And let's say, let's try to add uh, that same sort of effect here on the head. Let's see if this works. I don't think it will because it is the root bone. So we may have to um, pick a target. I wonder if we can do this with an empty. Let's see if we can do it with an empty. Jump into object mode. Create an empty here. And then let's pick that for our target for inverse kinematics. OK, so now you can see this is heading back towards the empty here. So getting some weird effects there. Go ahead and clear the IK on this back here. Pull target. Let's see. Let's see what else we're gonna do with this empty over here. I'm gonna duplicate this one. I'm gonna call this pull target so it's easy to see where it is. And let's pick this right here. Okay, so uh, not sure if the IK is workable if you do it from the root bone. Uh, there may be a way to override that, but I'm not really sure. So uh, maybe something to play with. Let's see if we can get this back in the right place over here. Okay. Uh, let's pull target. another area over here we need to fix with our white painter. Uh, but let's get rid of the IK and play a little bit with some animation here. So we got a swing around. Might want to come back the other way. I'm gonna add back that other IK. And I'm going to go the other way first. Let's grab all of our bones, insert the rotation.
In this case, we're not going to get that same effect that we're trying to go for with this. So I'm going to grab all of my bones, hit uh, Alt-R to clear the rotation back out, and we're going to start from a clean slate here. Uh, let's take our IK influence back down to zero in this case. And let's rotate up here. So if we're going to do an actual uh, rig for a snake, I would probably add some more controls to make this a little easier to move from either direction. Uh, you might want to add something that lets you switch whether you control the IK from the head or the tail. Uh, but we would have to play a little bit more on a different evening with that. So I hope you guys have enjoyed tonight. Um, we are going to be moving forward uh, again with the uh, project that we talked about uh, last night, which is the dragon. So if you weren't here last night, this is uh, recorded and up on the live stream uh, on, the, on the YouTube channel. So this is the concept art we kind of worked on and came up with. And we had some other sketches we were kind of doing on top of it, talking about how the wings were folding and unfolding and some other uh, ideas for how the dragon could be unique compared to other dragons out there. So I'm gonna do a lot more iterations uh, you know, on my own and then come back at some point when I have the final design to share with you guys. Uh, and this is gonna be an entirely new course. Uh, may do some more live streams about what I'm doing to get this prepared, uh, but it will be an entire course uh, on visual effects and Blender uh, because I'm actually doing this for a uh, film that we're working on at uh, the studio. So, uh, so, uh, tonight, I hope you guys enjoyed the animation part of it. As you can see, the dragon's going to have sort of a snake-like body. And so that's going to be the same idea that we did tonight, uh, with a little bit more complicated rig for the rest of this. Uh, but I'll be back next week, Wednesday through Friday, 7 PM central time on this channel, uh, is when I do my live streams. We shake it up a little bit. You know, sometimes we do blender, sometimes we do Photoshop. Uh, and we're getting into a lot of other software down the road. So it will just depend on what we're working on that evening. But really glad you guys showed up tonight and uh, took the time to hang out with me. Uh, thank you guys for participating and um, leaving comments and things like that. I love reading all of the ideas and uh, you know the encouragement from you guys. And so uh, please like and subscribe if you haven't already and uh, leave me a comment in the comment section about what you thought about tonight. If you wanted to learn more, if you want to go in a different direction, uh, the only way I know how to, um, what to talk about in the live streams or for the tutorials is uh, to talk to you guys and to have you give me feedback. So uh, enjoy spending some time with you guys. I'll see you again next week. And until then, uh, happy blending.